Okay, so I'm the only thing between you guys and the swag, right? I usually say you guys in the bar, but uh, it's swag and I saw it all downstairs and it's absolutely fabulous. So when Casey called me and asked me to come and speak to you all, I was so thrilled and excited because I absolutely love talking to organizations that are going through change and making a difference in the world. And that's exactly what you guys are doing here tonight with the unveiling of your new logo and saying, you know, the synergies of all of us working together is better than having perhaps three separate corporations that are doing different things in silos. Maybe there's a way there's some efficiencies of services that we deliver. So kudos to all of you for doing that. And I want to say thank you to Casey and Jordan and Louisa for um, having me here and um, all the little hand holding they did up to this point. I have to tell you, it was the e you guys are the easiest group. There's uh, no drama, which is, uh, which is always nice. I, I work with groups that sometimes there's a lot of drama. <laughs> that said, <laughs> I want to talk to you about my life, which seemed to be always filled with drama and where I ended up. First of all, I want to ask you, and you don't have to put your hands up, but I want you to start thinking about this. How many of you absolutely love your life and every aspect of it? How many of you say, I kind of love my life, but I have these goals, and I have these dreams, and I have these things that I want to achieve. I want to buy a house. I want to get married. I want to travel in Europe. I want to get this promotion. I want to lose weight. I want to gain weight. I want to plant a garden. I, I want to travel. How many of you get stuck on, but how am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? I always like to start with a story to set the stage. So imagine if we were walking down the sidewalk of Chicago, and you came upon a construction site, which is not hard in the summer in Chicago. <laughs> and you walk in, you see this person, usually a man, and he is working there and you ask him what he's doing. Sir, what are you doing? And he says, well, isn't it obvious I'm piling bricks? Okay. And then you walk about 25 feet further down the sidewalk and you ask the second man who's working on the same project what he's doing. And he says, well, isn't it pretty obvious I'm building a wall? And you walk 25 feet further down the sidewalk and you ask the third person, who, by the way, is doing the same thing as the first and second person, what they are doing? And they respond by telling you, I'm building a great cathedral. Sometimes when we're moving through the motions in our lives to get toward our goals and our dreams, it can feel like we're piling bricks. Sometimes it can feel like we're building a wall. And sometimes we forget that it's really a beautiful cathedral we're building in our lives. So I want to talk to you about transformational change. I want to talk to you about the power of three. And I want to talk to you about how I got hit by a taxi, but you look run over. <laughs> so my life, my life was one of being on this treadmill, of going all the time. I thought if, I, if it wasn't hard, it wasn't worthwhile. I would spend hours in the kitchen cooking when I was having friends over and be exhausted and not able to even enjoy the conversation because I was exhausted when all they really wanted to do was sit with me and talk. They didn't care if we had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or ordered a pizza in. I would find the most difficult recipes. I would find the most amazing recipes to make. And really, they just wanted my company. But I was busy running up and down the stairs and you know, barbecuing outside and stuff in the oven and stuff in the crock pot. My life was always go, go, go. But I had some hopes, and I had some dreams, and I had some goals. But they seemed to be buried. They seemed to be buried by everyday life. I love using this as an example. So imagine this is your life, and you've got some goals. And you have your goals. Maybe you want to buy a house. Maybe you want a new job. Maybe you want to get married. Maybe you want to lose weight. Maybe you want a promotion. You want to travel to Europe. You, want, you have these goals, these pretty lofty goals here. And then there's the stuff of life, which is, I got to go to work. I got to you know, pay the rent. You know, there's all the things you have to do. I have to, you know, go to the doctors. I have to go to the dry cleaner. I have to do all these other things that keep me from my goals. Pretty soon your goals start to get buried. They're harder and harder to see. And then you have the dreaded, 
I love the visual of this. You have the dreaded, like, all the little things you have to do. I have to mow the lawn. I have to pick the kids up. I have to write that agenda. I'm on the condo board. And all of a sudden, your goals are more and more covered up. And then, if you go with me one more, it's your emotions. I'm really irritated today. I had a fight today. I, you know, I, it's, uh, it's bad. Uh, there's no gas in the car. Hubby didn't put gas in the car. You have all these emotions going on. And pretty soon, your goals are really hard to see because life takes over. And five days go by, and five weeks go by, and five months go by, and five years go by. And all of a sudden you say, gosh, I really wanted to do that, but it never happened. I just thought if I kept working harder, those goals would be seen. The goals of the things I wanted would be seen if I just kept working harder. So every time I went home, to visit my family, I took a laptop and a briefcase, and they would sigh. My mom and my siblings, like, because I would pull that out, and I would have to work. I'd have to work part of the weekend. I would, a good day was when I had seven meetings. A bad day was when I had 11, and I still had to work at night. And I just thought that was normal. I kept waiting for my life to happen so I could get to my goals and my dreams. And then I got hit by a taxi, literally. About a year and a half ago, it was September of 2014. I was at a meeting, it ended at eight o'clock. I was on Wacker and Monroe, and I was walking to my car on Clark and Kinsey. And I notice a lot of you have these Fitbits. How many of you walk around your dining room table at night to get the steps in? <laughs> oh yeah, that's me, walk around the dining room table, I'll get my steps in, but this I had on. Okay, I'm going to walk from that meeting to my car where it's parked, and I will get my steps in. So I was walking down Wacker, jogged over to Franklin, ended up on Lake Street, was walking, and I was in about two-thirds of the way through a crosswalk on a street called Post, which is a one-block street that goes down to Lower Wacker. You've seen the Blues Brothers. It's where they take the vehicle, bum, 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 bum. They go down under, or where... Um, Gotham City scenes are filmed. And the first thing I realized was my jaw hurt. The taxi had hit my left calf and propelled me in the air to the point where I landed on my butt on the hood of the car. And I landed so hard I indented the hood, but my jaw hurt. I hit my head on the windshield. And at this point, he was turning, and I was turning, and I turned 180 degrees to where I was staring at him over my feet. I could see it. He was a taxi driver. And I was riding on the hood of the car going down to Lower Wacker. I had two thoughts at that time. The first was, how long is this going to last? because everything seemed to be going in slow motion. And those of you who've been in you know, traffic accidents, car accidents, know everything moves really slowly when that happens. And then I thought, how am I going to get off the hood of this car? And I was sitting backwards on the hood of the car, and I normally don't sit on hoods of cars, let alone backwards on hoods of car. But I realized as he was braking, momentum and physics were taking over, and I was flying off the front of the car backwards. And I landed about three or four feet in front of him, again on my butt, with my head, I was going downhill, about to hit the ground, and I slammed down my arms so my head wouldn't hit. For some reason, I had this really cognizant awareness that I had to keep my head from being hit. And then he drove over me. This way, not this way. He drove over me. And at that point in time, I thought for sure I was dead, that I was 51 and I was going out by taxi because there was no way I could move, that he was coming so fast. The police officers think he hit me going 35 miles an hour. Sometime when you're driving down the street and you're going 35 miles an hour, remember the story. I figure he hit me going 35 miles an hour. Couldn't roll out of the way. I just thought, this is it. I'm 51 and I'm dead, going out by taxi. And all those hopes and dreams and goals were buried under the 11 meetings a day, 
the briefcase at home, the hard meals I was making, all that stuff and all my goals and dreams weren't going to happen. And then he stopped. He stopped right here. Stop. And then he backed over me because he had to get the car off my body. <laughs> so not only did he drive over me, he backed off of me. Um, and at that time, I was probably the most scared because I was laying splayed out in the middle of a street, and it's pretty dark. It's about 8.20 at night, and nobody knew, or I thought nobody had seen it. And I thought he was leaving. He wasn't. And a frequent question I get asked is, were there people in the back of the cab? Was the meter running? No, there was nobody in the cab. <laughs> it was an empty cab. Two um, Good Samaritans came in, James and Ryan, who I dedicate the book to. They came in to take care of me, and they figured out who was going to direct traffic and who was going to call the ambulance. At which point, the cab driver kept talking to me, and I thought, I really don't want to hear from you. <laughs> like, you just ran me over. I'm sure you're a really nice guy, but <laughs> you just ran me over. <laughs> Um, so they got the, they said the ambulance and the fire department was coming and all that was happening and um, the, I think the cab driver was trying to be helpful when he suggested they put me in the back of his cab and he would drive me to the hospital. <laughs> I thought, oh God, no, please, no, no, no. <laughs> but eventually the ambulance came and um, Rob and Kate got out and they started attending to me, the paramedics. And Kate was talking to me, and that's when Rob looked at me and he said, Lisa, did you take your shoes off? And I looked down at my feet and my shoes were off. The cab had hit me so hard that one shoe blew to the east side of the sidewalk and was on the side of the curb, and the other shoe was on the west side of the sidewalk, on the sidewalk. Now, they weren't shoes like I'm wearing today, they were Donald Pliner boots. He blew me out of Donald Pliner boots. At that point, they decided to take me to trauma ER at Northwestern University. I was just happy to be alive at this point. I didn't know what worked, what didn't work, but I was happy to be alive. I said, sure, I'll go to trauma ER. OK, word to all you women, your mama was right. <laughs> trauma ER means <laughs> they cut off all your clothes. And the only thought I had was, did I wear matching bra and panty today? <laughs> Truly, like, oh my God, my mom was right. She was so right. <laughs> Are they matching? And they were, okay? <laughs> but they were cut off. <laughs> they were no good anymore. They had a lot of doctors working on me, they said, and they could find nothing wrong. Because while nothing physically on the outside was happening, they were sure internally there was something wrong. And test after test after test came back and said there was nothing wrong. To the point where halfway through the exam, the one doctor looked at the other and said, has she been drinking? <laughs> to which the other surgeon responded, no, there's no drugs or alcohol in her blood screen. And apparently it was really important to me that they not think I was a teetotaler, because I said from the gurney, but I was going home to have a glass of wine. <laughs> like, just want you all to know, I do like my glass of wine. Test after test after test came back negative. And they let me go from the hospital that night. Four and a half hours later, they put me in paper sweats, you know, paper gown, you know, those garments. It's sort of like when you have your annual physical ladies, that type of a gown fluttering in the back. Um, I had a, uh, they gave me the bag with all my cut off clothes. It was see through. They had me drink some ginger ale. I didn't even get Vicodin or Valium or Tylenol, nothing. And uh, they made me put back on those shoes I was wearing. And they sent me home in a cab. <laughs> God is ironic. If you have a belief in a higher power, uh, it was ironic. So when I get home at 1.30 in the morning, I said to the cab driver, he wasn't the same one, by the way, <laughs> I said, by the way, I said, um, can you watch me and make sure I get in my house because I, I got hit by a cab tonight. <laughs> He's like, what? I said, well, if I fall, I just want to fall on the inside of the house, not the outside. Next day, I got up and I went to work. I was the first one in my office. I gathered my staff at about 9.15. I said, I need to tell you something happened last night. And they go, what? You went to that meeting. What happened? I go, well, I kind of got hit and run over by a taxi. And I go, well, what are you doing at work? 
I don't know, that was just how I lived my life. That was just how I lived my life. The part of the story I didn't tell you was that when I was laying on the gurney between tests in the hospital, I heard a voice. And the voice said to me, it's all bullshit except happiness and joy. Now, I thought, who is saying that? And I had the collar on, I'm like, who is saying that? I'm looking around, and I hear it again. It's all bullshit except happiness and joy. <clears throat> now, people who know me know I can swear a lot, but I uh, like the uh, swear word that rhymes with hockey puck and not the hockey part, you know, the other part <laughs> that rhymes with the other word. Bullshit's just not a word I use. And I was like, who is talking to me? And what is this message I'm getting? I just kept hearing it. Next day when I was at the office, I got two free tickets to go see Oprah Live the Life You Want weekend. One of my friends called me and said, you're from Michigan. Do you like Oprah? You want to go to Detroit? She's doing this thing. I said, yeah. She said, the only catch is you got to take a mentor, mentee, somebody you're mentoring. I go, well, I have a 20-year-old niece. I'll call her. So I call my niece, Anna. I go, Anna, do you want to go to Detroit? And she lives in northern Michigan. And see Oprah live the life you want weekend? And she, she goes, yeah, but mom said you were hit by a taxi last night. <laughs> Are you sure you can go? I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can't come and get you, but if you can get there, I can get there. And people were aghast. They started saying, well, why are you going? And I just thought it, it was the shift that was starting me. How long was I supposed to wait? A day, a week, a month, a year to start living my life? When, when, was, when was I going to start living it again? So we went to Oprah Live the Life You Want weekend in Detroit, and Oprah talks about how you, everybody has this intuition about how, what's right, what's wrong, if you should go left, right, up, down, if your goals, if you're working toward them. And if you don't listen to that intuition, the whisper, she calls it, the whisper gets louder. And if you still don't listen to the whisper, the universe will start throwing bricks at you. And eventually, you hit the brick wall. And that's when my 20-year-old niece turned to me and said, Aunt Lisa, I think you hit the brick wall. When I think back about the year before that, the year of 2013 into 2014, it's as clear as a bell now the changes I need to make to live a life of happiness and joy, to be able to see my goals and dreams, and to be able to achieve what I wanted to achieve in my life. But it took literally being knocked off my feet, taking a ride on the hood of a car, having my shoes blown off, and starting on the journey. It took about another six months to really settle in. It took about another six months till I decided I didn't want to do crazy anymore. I didn't want to live a life of 11 meetings a day and working every weekend and carrying a briefcase everywhere and being busy. You know, I thought it was smart because I heard somebody say, you know, we all walk around saying, oh, I'm so busy. I'm so busy, like it's a badge of honor. And somebody says, well, you should say you have a full life. I go, okay, I have a full life. I have a full life. <laughs> but I wasn't changing anything. I was simply changing the words. I wasn't changing anything to what I wanted to do. So six months later, I said, I went home, had a glass of wine. Um, and I thought, I don't want to do crazy anymore. So I decided to close a business. I had created the institute about two years before that. That's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach. I wanted to write. I wanted to speak. I wanted to coach clients. And I said, when am I going to, how old am I going to have to be before my dream comes true, before my goals get realized? And in a year, a lot has changed. I don't set an alarm anymore in the morning. I wake up when I wake up. I don't work Monday mornings or Friday afternoons. That was always a dream of mine, not to do that. I take a nap every afternoon. It's about a 20-minute meditative power nap, but it's to like reboot the computer, because I'm writing books or articles or columns or what have you, talking and speaking and teaching. I make time for friends. I don't miss events. 
and I learned how to say no. I learned how to say, no, I don't want to do that. No, that doesn't align with my goals and my vision for my life. No. So I wrote the book. I got hit by a taxi, but you look run over. Life lessons for happiness and joy. And one of the things I would say is determine what your goals are. You can have one goal. You can have two goals. You can have three goals. I usually have about five going. I have, you know, a personal, professional, a fun. You have to have a fun. I thought what I did Friday night was fun. It was terror. I did stand-up comedy Friday night. You guys are a lot safer than they were, let me tell you. <laughs> no, I thought it was going to be ill. 90 people, I thought, oh, my God, I can't do this. My friend goes, well, come back in September. I thought, are you crazy? I'm here. Let's do it. But um, always find a goal. Try to do a professional goal, set a professional goal every year, a personal goal, and a fun goal. Lisa talked about, you know, how I do flying trapeze. I love flying through the air. I love flying planes. I love, um, I did a Tough mutter. I didn't love that. You know, there's a lot of dirt involved in that. I didn't quite think that one through, but, you know. But you set some goals and you decide what you want to do. That's the first thing. Um, do three things every day towards your goal. That was my fifth book called The Power of Three. How to achieve your goals by simply doing three things a day. Think about it this way. If you set a goal, I want to buy a house, I want to get married, I want to lose weight, I want to go to Europe, whatever it is, and every day, Monday through Friday, do three things toward it, that's 15 things a week, that's 60 things a month, that's 780 things a year. If you are doing 780 things toward your goal, you're going to be really close to it if not achieving it. And I'm not talking big things. Say you were wanting to plan a trip. You were wanting to spend a summer in Europe. And one thing might be planning a day to go to the library to check out books. Or to go, well, there's no bookstores anymore, but, you know, go to Amazon.com and order some travel books. Setting up a bank account to put some money in. Going to HR and directing your payroll deposit. It's not big things. It's taking, it's that old adage, how do you eat an elephant? A bite at a time. How do you get to your goals? A step at a time. Do three things a day toward your goal. The second thing I would offer about achieving your goals and having change happen in your life is be tenacious. Do not give up. Lisa's husband and I have been working on something for 15 months. 15 months we've been working on an idea, talking about it. Neither one of us gave up, and it's getting really close. One of my friends, who I wrote about her in my first book, Carolyn Gable, said, I think life is like, imagine God gave you a million scratch-off lottery tickets, and God said there was a multi-million dollar winner in those scratch-off lottery tickets. Carolyn said, would you give up scratching after you scratched 632,557? Would you not scratch the 58th and 59th ticket? No, you'd keep scratching. You'd keep scratching because you knew there was a winner in there. And that's all of your lives with your goals and your dreams. There's a winner in there. And then be you. You know, it's an old adage. You know, only you can be you. <laughs> It's true. I have a story that I always share about um, a seminar. I'm always looking to improve, and so I went to the seminar about women's voices in the media, and that women's voices aren't heard, and a lot of it is because we don't submit op-eds, and we don't submit columns, and we don't write. We don't think our voice should be heard, or can be heard, or has a, um, a position um, in that place. And so I went to this um, seminar, but I traveled a lot at that time. And I got to eat in all the best restaurants. And when they sent out information about the seminar, which was here in Chicago, they said, and here's the restaurants you can go to for lunch. I looked and I thought, well, that's not what I want to do, because I just had food delivered from Peapod to my home. And what I really wanted to do was eat my all-time favorite sandwich, which is ham and cheese on white bread with Miracle Whip. 
Honest to God, that's my favorite sandwich. Ham and cheese on white bread with Miracle Whip. Cheddar cheese, not American, okay, I prefer. But ham and cheese on white bread with Miracle Whip. And of course, in the groceries that were delivered, I had ham, cheese, white bread, and Miracle Whip. So I made my sandwich, put my little chips in the Ziploc bag, you know, I had my little granola bar, and I went to the seminar. And it was a great morning discussion. There were about 40 of us from Wisconsin and Michigan and Indiana and Illinois and Ohio talking. And then it came for lunchtime, and I went downstairs and got a nice tea from the Starbucks, and I came back up, and everybody had left the room. I thought, well, this is really smart, Lisa. You could have been networking, you could have been talking, making connections with people. And I thought, well, you know those restaurants, you could run around, maybe you could recognize them, and maybe you could find them and talk to them. And I thought, but I really want that ham and cheese sandwich and white bread with Miracle Whip. So I thought, well, I'm going to eat. So that was me being authentic. So I ate the ham and cheese, started eating the ham and cheese sandwich and white bread with Miracle Whip. And lo and behold, another woman came in the room, and she had her little sack lunch, and we started laughing about how we were the only two who did that. She asked what I did. I told her I helped people do philanthropy better. She had started a nonprofit organization after her husband had died to talk about end-of-life care. She's a younger woman, a reporter from WGN. I appear in the media, on TV and radio, another connection. But what happened is, two weeks later after that seminar, she called me and she said, hey, I'm doing the afternoon shift on NPR, WBEZ. Can you come and talk for an hour about philanthropy? Because I had a ham and cheese sandwich on white bread with Miracle Whip. Here's the better part. The next day, the phone rings in the office. As I'm going to leave, one of my staff members puts the person on mute and says, do you know anybody named Susan Axelrod? I go, oh no, that's probably a, a marketing call. You know, I'm out the door. I get in the back of the car, my car service, because I can text and drive better than anyone and I want everyone else to be safe, so I use a car service. I'm in the back, I go, Susan Axelrod? I said, is that David's wife? She goes, no, my staff member goes, no. I go, is she talking about an epilepsy foundation? Their oldest daughter has epilepsy. She goes, yeah. Susan Axelrod hired me to give a speech like this at her organization because she heard me on NPR, because I talked to a woman who brought her brown bag lunch, because I had the courage to be me and eat a ham and cheese sandwich on white bread with Miracle Whip. It's the little things. It's the little things that have the big ripples in the pond. So every day, do three things towards your goal. But don't forget yourself. Do three things for yourself. Every day, I have three things that I like to happen. I like to have a really good cup of coffee in the morning. You know, when you stay in a hotel, that bad coffee sometimes in hotels. Not this hotel, but any other hotel. <laughs> OK, this hotel is great coffee. No. Um, yeah, OK. <laughs> um, I like to exercise for an hour. I'm a walker, you know, Fitbit, averaging 19,000 steps a day. That's a little, I'm a little OCD, OK, but that's OK. I work stuff out. And at the end of the day, I like to have a really good glass of wine. But if only one of those three things happen every day, it's still a good day. Because it's I'm focused on me. I've got some things that I want to do. But I also feel like because I work in the field of philanthropy, and there's so much we can do, that I need to do something to give back every day. So every day, like your Inherit the Earth program, I try to pick up a piece of garbage every day and put it in the right receptacle. Because those of us of a certain age remember the Native American commercial walking through the litter, the tear coming down the cheek. OK, now I have all my friends doing it. We're all picking up garbage when we're walking, you know? Around, not around our dining room table, but when we're walking other places. But I try to pick up a piece of garbage and put it in the right receptacle. Every day I try to write a piece of personal correspondence to somebody to make a difference in their world. When was the last time you got a handwritten note? In the mail, not email. One of my friends told me after her husband died that he would write notes to people he saw in the newspaper that were going through hard times that everybody was beating up on. Just to say, keep the faith, have the faith. That was the way he gave back. 
The third thing I try to do every day is pay a genuine compliment to someone. Because I think we go through this world and we're so competitive. And we're one-upping each other, especially on Facebook and social media. And to just take a step back and say, gosh, that was a really great speech you gave. Or gosh, that's a really great dress you're wearing. Or gosh, that's a really great article you wrote. Paying a genuine compliment to someone. Your things could be completely different. The three things you do for yourself and the three things you do for the world, for someone else. And by the way, I view exercise as the only thing I do for myself that only benefits me. That's the way I get out every day and I start exercising because it benefits me, it takes care of me. It's something that I give back to myself every single day. The world is huge. And you can get lost in it. You can get lost in you know, the everydayness of, you know, I've got meeting agendas, and I've got carpool, and I've got you know, doctor's appointments, and dentist appointments, and Christmas shopping. And all of a sudden, a year goes by, and two years go by. Don't wait to be hit and run over by a taxi to change your life. I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm one of the lucky ones who got to walk away and not have a thing wrong with me. Not everybody does that. Sometimes transformation takes place in other ways. But every one of you can achieve your goals and your dreams, whatever they are. And they should always be changing. You know, um, I was kayaking. I didn't put that on my list, Lise. I was kayaking down the Chicago River. And I was the old lady on the trip, you know. Uh, you, you turn around, you now you got to go against the current. It's like, oh, my God, what was I thinking? And uh, I was talking, the guide slowed down. He was a 26-year-old engineer for the city. He had gone to the University of Illinois. And he was telling me he didn't much like his job, what, he'd done, what he did at the city. And then he asked me what I did, and I said, I help people do philanthropy better, help people change the world. And he goes, I have to tell you about my roommate, Billy. He said, you know, we're young, we're 26, we don't have a lot of money, he said, but every single day, Billy, all day long, smiles at people, waves at people, or acknowledges people. And when he asked him why he does that, Billy said, because he read somewhere that the number one reason that people cite who are contemplating suicide as the reason they don't do it is that somebody said hello, Somebody waved at them. Somebody acknowledged them. Somebody spoke to them. And he says, my friend Billy says, he's pretty sure at the end of every day that he's probably saved a life. I said, do you think that's true, Lisa? I said, yeah. It's the little things in life that make the greatest transformation. You guys are part of an amazing organization that's talking about living with heart. You guys are all about heart. And the courageous step you're all taking today to come together in certain aspects of your organization as one so that the message gets louder. Find that thing that moves your heart personally, professionally, and for the world and do it every single day because then you will live a life of happiness and joy. Thank you.